And we have Dr. Natalie Lalar. Uh, I'm not sure if I pronounced her name right because I haven't heard it before. And Lisa Newman. Dr. Natalie Dana Lalar is a Passamaquoddy Penobscot tribal member by heritage and ancestral lines. She grew up on, it's getting dark in the room. She, she grew up on Marakamet Ma. The Madoc, book. Okay, thank you. <laughs> in the township in Maine. She is a PhD graduate from the University of Maine in anthropology and environmental policy. Dr. Lisa Newman is an associate professor of anthropology and Native American studies at the University of Maine. Lisa states, while Natalie is my graduate student, she more often is not, she more often than not is my teacher. Their talk centers on indigenous scholarship in archeology span and cultural anthropology, focusing on their work with the uh, uh, Matthias Bay Petroglyphs and is titled Petroglyphs, Ancestors and Indigenous Methodologies in Archeology. span Oh, sorry, in anthropology, it's really dark in the room. So I'm turning it over to you. Let's, and it's your show. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Natalie. Natalie needs to turn on her mic, though. So I wanted to see, can you also see my, my screen here? Yes. Okay, great. So this is called Petroglyphs, Ancestors, and Indigenous Methodologies in Anthropology. And we're going to do this in two different voices. So I'm going to start, and we would like to thank you for joining us. We are both coming to you from the Dawn land. We are also from the University of Maine, so I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. The University of Maine recognizes that it is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq through kinship alliances and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot Nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct sovereign and legal and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. The petroglyphs about which we speak to get today are located in the homelands of the Passamaquoddy tribes. We'd like to give some acknowledgement to Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Donald Soctoma for his partnership in our work on the Machias Bay petroglyphs. So let me quickly introduce myself, but I think I had a good introduction already, so I'll do it quickly. I live and work in the traditional homelands of the Penobscot Nation, and I do research in the traditional homelands of the Passamaquoddy tribes. I'm a cultural anthropologist in a Native American studies program whose work is focused on Oklahoma and more recently, Maine. Natalie is my grad student, but as uh, was said earlier, she is often my teacher. We met for the first time at this petroglyph site that we're going to talk about today, many years ago, actually. And in recent years, we've both been teaching K through 12 students, uh, COVID aside, about the petroglyphs and cultural preservation using 3D printing and working with Donald Soctoma. My work as a guest living in the Dawn land has taught me many important lessons. I take inspiration from Bernie Purley and Robin Wall Kimmerer, I know that to be worth doing, scholarship must be humanizing rather than otherizing. It must be based on reciprocity and gratitude. It must create connection rather than distance. It must be felt rather than simply known. From Linda Smith and Margaret Kovac, I know that the work we must do must be culturally important to living people and that we must work to decolonize our academic paradigms and power relationships. From Les Field, I've learned that we sometimes must be shape shifters in our work offering theoretical concepts and work that is tailored to the needs of the indigenous communities we serve or of which we are a part. And from my colleague, Darren Ranko, I have seen examples of interdisciplinary and intertribal partnerships that find innovative solutions to important issues centered on tribal sovereignty, the environment and social justice. In what today we often call Maine, there are five federally recognized tribes, the Penobscot Nation, the Pass Passamaquoddy tribe at Sabayak or Pleasant Point, the Passamaquoddy tribe at Madankmaguk or Indian Township, the Holton Band of Maliseet, and the Uristic Band of Mi'kmaq. Collectively, the tribes of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawnland, and their traditional homelands comprise what is today northern New England in the US as south and southeastern Quebec and the Canadian maritime provinces of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. There are approximately 8,000 people on the membership rolls of the five Wabanaki tribes with a far greater number in Canada. A little background on the subjects of this paper, the petroglyphs 
and their cultural context. In Down East Maine, Washington County, home to the Passamaquoddy, there are a number of shell mounds intentionally placed by their ancestors that sit not far from amazing petroglyph sites surrounding Machias Bay. This is a photo on the screen of a larger shell midden from another part of Maine. And this is taken in the 19th century. And this is one of the biggest ones. I use it here actually because the shell midden sites around Machias Bay where we work have largely eroded due to human disruption and sea level rise. Once thought of as simply refuse sites, after all, what value could they have had, said the white archeologists in the night, not too distant past. Um, the history and meanings of these middens are now being written, rewritten by indigenous archaeologists, including Natalie. Back to the petroglyphs. One site in particular in Machiasport is at least 3,000 years old and dominates the eight other petroglyph sites on the bay. This spot in Machiasport contains well over half the known petroglyphs in the area, covering two major ledges, the largest concentration in the northeast. And this is a good view of one of the ledges in the fog. You can see how the water ebbs and flows around the rock ledges. The boundaries of land and sea, not always distinct, sun and shadow, rising and receding tides, fog and crystal clear skies, all alter human perceptions of the petroglyph petroglyphs on the landscape. In 2006, the Passamaquoddy tribe regained possession of this main petroglyph site with help from the Maine Coast Heritage Trust. It was a time for ceremony. And this shows people standing on one of the ledges at high tide where it's almost covering part of that long ledge. And this would be facing approximately east. We see the petroglyphs in this case, not carvings, but actually images pecked into coastal rock to have enduring agency and personhood that connect past to present for the Passamaquoddy. This shows you a little bit of the, the peckings in the rock. Although some older petroglyphs still conceal their identities from us under rising coastal seawaters, time is not linear on the ledges exposed to human sight. A heart may be signaling new or young love etched in vandalism on the stone and then partially erased by another person. Some petroglyphs here appear to depict stories of contact with Europeans. One such petroglyph on the left has been identified as Champlain's ship sailing into Machias Bay, but others think it perhaps is another type of European sailing vessel. Next to it on the right, a cross. Some petroglyphs depict familiar fauna, and other petroglyphs appear to depict shamans, religious rites, and childbirth, the stuff of the sacred. Many of those petroglyphs are connected to stories still held within the tribe, such as Thunderbird, as described later in a poem by Natalie. Now, our approach attempts to decenter, decolonize, and reframe anthropological assumptions and practices by using indigenous methodologies that expand notions of personhood agency, multi-species entanglements in time. These petroglyphs are not only a creation of people, they are also agents whose material natures act upon those who arduously peck them in the past and those who attempt to view and decipher them in the present. What are we missing when we don't consider how petroglyphs may relate to and interact with those who made them or view them today? What can we learn from multi-species ethnographies and archeologies span that decenter the human and listen to the voices of and in the rocks. Scholars have been thinking and writing in new ways about human relationships to objects, sometimes called the inhuman in decentering fashion. The agency of objects and also how human interactions with objects help shape perceptions of space and time. Anthropologist Anna Singh decenters the human in her multi-species ethnography about the global trade in a sought after mushroom that tends to thrive on the edges of capitalist ruins. Historian Ron Richardson creates centered objects like chairs and stone tools in his own scholarship stating that temporarily, temporality is produced as a byproduct of our interactions with objects. Put another way, time and space are functions of our interactions with objects. According to Richardson, human being is inseparable from our interactions with objects as well as other living creatures. We are always in relationship to them. Elizabeth Povanelli unpacks European and Euro-American settler colonial and neoliberal constructions of bios, life, 
and geos, things like rocks, and what she calls the geontological power involved in this binary opposition, where bios is seen as ontological, as being in the world, while geos, things like rocks, not so much. And Catherine Yusuf writes about the temporal crossing of humans and the fungi and bacteria that live in and make up the pigments of Australian Aboriginal rock art and asks how a breakdown of the binary between the inhuman and human can better help us all live on planet Earth. These approaches resonate with and are sometimes informed by indigenous perspectives and worldviews, and they are masterful at deconstructing so-called Western ideologies, ontologies. Yet, how do the actual insights of indigenous scholars articulate with and expand on some of these insights? As we'll see, indigenous frames of reference and scholarship ask us to consider the petroglyphs not simply as existing beyond the binary of human and inhuman, but as ancestors and relatives with agency and instructions for us all. I now turn things over to Natalie. Luan, thank you, Lisa. Let me first introduce myself and who my family is to honor my upbringing. As a researcher, understanding the questions, who I am and where do I come from? It is important. Personal stories can provide a deeper explanation of who I am to quote data personally, professionally, emotionally, and spiritually as a researcher. My name is Natalie Dana Lawler. I am Passamaquoddy and Penobscot tribal member by heritage and ancestral lines. I grew up in Madoknago, Indian Township, Maine. My family names are Dana, Downing, Toma, and Lola of Indian Township and Neptune of Indian Island. I am born as a member of the Bear Clan of the Passamaquoddy. Once a long time ago, it happened when I was only 15 years old. My mother took me to visit the Nolabam Archaeological Field Site in Lenny Mems, Maine. This site, this event, set me upon a determined path. Next, when I was about 17 years old, I went to my very first archaeological field school run by the Abbey Museum of Maine. As I was in, in incrementally digging away at the earth of my trowel, I found a piece of pottery. I gently picked it up, brushing away the years. I noticed one side of the broken piece of pottery had a design upon it. After turning it over, I noticed the thumbnail of my ancestor who had impressed the design on, on the other side. As I sat there in wonderment, I realized that my thumbnail was the exact same size. This connection I felt at that moment with my Wabanaki ancestors has had me passionate about archaeology and anthropology ever since. This connection is a piece that is missing within modern Indigenous methods. A decolonization is needed in Indigenization. The feeling I get when I look upon the petroglyphs of my ancestors, their work, their art, their ceremony, their enduring traditions that held for thousands of years is a feeling of connection. Those petroglyphs allow me for a moment to feel time is circular, not linear, to feel my ancestors at that moment when they were touching the same stone, looking upon the image that was created for my people to remember. After respectfully, respectfully removing my shoes as to make sure I don't create more micro fractures, which would weaken the stone the, that the petroglyphs are on, I stand there for a moment with my skin connected to that stone, knowing that my grandmother once stood there and her grandmothers before her stood there. These thoughts seep into my research methods, looking at that connection of my ancestors. What are the questions my ancestors would, would have wanted me to ask? What are the questions that I should be asking to help my people? While looking through archives, and things such as that. I was, I was, I sat there in wonderment of all of my ancestors' artifacts and surviving possessions of their lives that is still here, held in boxes. These possessions are, they never are destined to see the light of day, let alone to be seen by their descendants. I connected to something that Ryan Moriani said 
Most of all, most of all of it disappears in archives and gray lit reports that many are often unable to access without a PhD in archeology span or anthropology. I started to think about the reports that were written on these art ancestral artifacts and features such as petroglyphs and how a non-native or non-indigenous person determined the relationship of use and interpretation. Much of our written histories are written by people who are not our people. As we move forward, it is possible to decolonize, is it possible to decolonize what has already been done? As we decolonize these research paradigms, it will encourage a greater appreciation of indigenous history and worldviews, thus allowing indigenous peoples to look forward towards a future while ne neither de uh, demonetizing or um, romanticizing the past, which is words from Wilson. Can decolonization, decolonization mean in reinterpretations of the, these petroglyphs? Once again, telling the stories that our ancestors meant for us to carry on. Can we hope to heal some of the harm that has been done by severing those connections? As we look forward, extending the agency, uh, understanding the agency to include our ancestors artifacts and petroglyphs is something that should be discussed. I look at artifacts like living beings that have a soul of their very own, a piece of our ancestors hidden away in each one waiting for us. Through my ancestors' intentional creation of certain objects, they imbued them with their own agency. To have agency, an object must create a mental or physical state within humans. All these are fancy words for saying that I believe artifacts are animate that they have pieces of the souls of my ancestors contained within them. Like the piece of pottery that I, feel, uh, that I found that it feels like ages, a lifetime ago. It's important to remember the agency of artifacts and what they mean to us, to indigenous people. The connection and the energy I feel in these surviving artifacts, these sacred petroglyphs, is a feeling of holding and seeing something that is so much more than a thing. So we tard um, urges us to rethink the way we look at human and non-human relations. Todd challenged us, challenged the way that we look at oil for one, to think of oil as a non-human kin, kin. She says, I hope that I encourage settler Canadians to understand that tending to the reciprocal relationship we hold with fish and other non more than human things is integral to supporting the narrow conditions of existence in this place. This way of looking at our non-human kin also had my thoughts racing about that connection and energy that I felt when touching um, our ancestors' objects. Can we extend this concept of non-human kin to the physical objects that remain from our ancestors? In her Ethnography of Climate Change in Native Alaska, Elizabeth Murano, um, asked what makes a relationship social and what are the relationships can um, um, what makes the relationship social and what are, are such relationships confined to human beings why should it be supposed that we en encounter the non-human components of our relate of our environment animals plants and animate objects in their sheer materi um, materiality what do we mean by saying that our relationships with these components are material so the petroglyphs that we speak of, which are located in Machaisport, are at least 3,000 years old. That can be proven academically so far. 3,000 years of carrying on a tradition of petroglyph making passed from generation to generation of my people. We continue to go to the same place, carving stories upon that rock for 3,000 years. If we can call oil our non-human kin, can we not understandably also include things from our ancestors? How do we then dismantle this process of colonization and decolonize the way forward? These questions raise concerns when thinking about all those interpretations that are held within the reports. 
These petroglyphs, these ancestral creations of deeply held stories for thousands of years are interpreted by academia with little to no consultation with tribes from which they come from. The modern indigenous research methodology calls for understanding that there are multiple ways of knowing. This is why I highly value this type of work. The objects that our ancestors made can be seen and understood by their Wabanaki descendants. They can be brought out into light and once again teach. Interactions and relationships of humans with non-human other than human, uh, non-human other kin for indigenous people is essential to accept. The petroglyphs are our ancestors and they speak to us still, if we only listen. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a poem that I had written about which I speak about. Natalie, look in this bottom corner here. That may advance the slide. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, you might click on that. I'm not sure what she did, but I think she exited. <laughs> uh oh, did so I I saw somebody freeze. Did Natalie freeze on your screens as well? No, her her mouse was you was moving around the screen as if she was trying to advance to a new slide. Um, ah. and then she must have clicked on something and ended the um, session. Ended uh, her session. So. Um, I'm we not can, sure if she's, going to come, if she's going to come back. We can give her a second. Did she start reading her um, poem? No, it looked like it, it almost looked like she wanted the poem to be on the screen while she read it. Um, ah. It really wasn't necessary, but she wasn't reading anything. Okay. Let's give her just a second. And otherwise, I can just I can read it because I have it here. Yeah, she's, she's coming back on now. Oh, good, good, better. And let her know she can just read it. We don't have to see it. Hey, Where Matt, did I help you? Sorry, I was talking right away. No worries. Do you want to just read your poem? Yes. Sorry about that. Let's see. Uh, let's see. So I'm gonna try to sway Cortez. I wonder. I wonder. Will things ever change? As time slowly rips away, I wonder. I wonder. As the water tears away chunks of stone, slowly changing, rapidly changing, I wonder, I wonder, as I look upon the stone, how long will these things stay? I wonder, I wonder, as the hunter listens for game, mother giving birth, what shall I see? I wonder, I wonder, as Abu Duncan slithers on the surface and Thunderbird spreads his wings. I wonder, I wonder, as the little people are dancing, what will I leave the Wogunamasis today? I wonder, I wonder, moose, deer, people etched upon the stone, what has been lost? I wonder, I wonder about this magical spiritual place, this place that is born from our way of life. Thank you. Everyone, thank you. Okay, um, Natalie has muted. Lisa, um, where are we now? We are finished. Okay, so we're in the question and answer, and actually it's right on time, 7.40.
9.40 where you are. Um, so are there any questions from anyone uh, that's out there? Uh, I don't know if Clark is still hanging in, but he is an Aboriginal archeologist. I wonder he might be curious yeah. about this stuff. I am. Um, so not so much question, more comment. So my, um, in my bio, it has that sort of uncomfortable, that I've kind of always been uncomfortable in the fields of anthropology and archeology. span And um, uh, for me, especially while I was studying, um, at uni, there was at that time things like, oh, let's go and dig over here and try and piece this story together. But there was never any thought of, oh, let's go and speak with the community first <laughs> before we go and dig around in what is actually their heritage. Um, so that's sort of one thing that I've always been uncomfortable. And the second one is I've actually, I've used my degree to try and protect um, our cultural heritage from development from estates and that type of thing. And um, every time I've been unsuccessful. And um, so I've kind of walked away because uh, it's too, it's too gut wrenching. Um, it's too heartbreaking. And then um, sometimes our community don't actually understand that my hands are tied as well. And there's sometimes blame at the archeologist for what's seen as allowing it to happen. And, um, and that's always been sort of, so it's always been a, a difficult uh, place and I've always kind of wondered, well, what's, what's the point? <laughs> and I suppose it comes down to here in Australia, our cultural heritage is, is so undervalued um, that they actually don't care about um, ripping up a heritage site for the sake of an estate. Um, so one, well, there's a, there's a couple of local examples I'll talk about. One is where there was an estate of about maybe 500 houses. And in that particular area, there were approximately 3,000 artifacts turned up and yet the estate still went ahead. Um, and then another one, which is just across the road from my house, um, we actually tried to block, but again, we were unsuccessful. Um, I'm convinced that they will come across human remains at some point. Uh, and they're also creating um, and may, uh, may, uh, enormous uh, environmental damage because they actually have to build a bridge across a, um, a, a creek um, to make this estate. So that's why I've kind of, um, I've just, yeah, walked away from, from the field because it, uh, it's one that's been difficult uh, well, sometimes I'm like, what's the point? You know, what's the point in doing this cultural heritage assessment because you're going to do what you want anyway? Um, yeah, that's just, and that's just my experience in, in, in the field. So I'm sharing that. You know, as far as your home, you can always plant the seed of doubt. Yeah. Where, where you say, you know what? You could be digging up your ancestors' graves here. You know, this, this could be, this could be a, a, a white community. And for all you know, this could be a relative of yours. <laughs> well, that was, that's the crazy thing. We, we actually were successful in one. We actually got the, a highway moved uh, because they were going to go through 77 burials. Um, this is a few years ago. Um, but we had to fight hard. So in my presentation, I had a photo of myself and Uncle Bing and one of my friends. In the photo, he actually stood at the gate and wouldn't allow anyone through to create the development. He said, if anyone tries to come past me, basically you're going to get knocked out because that's the way he is. Um, and that's the level of we had to fight to save 77 burials. And, and it's not, and it wasn't even a, um, uh, it wasn't a, a traditional burial. This was a massacre burial. Um, and there were kids and as well. So this area is actually called Piccaninny Creek and Piccaninny is a highly racist term for an Aboriginal child. And so they were wanting to dig up these bones to 
figure out if these bones are Aboriginal or not. And we were saying, look at the look at the name that you have given this place. <laughs> um, and it's, it's not a wise idea. And, and we're also saying, why do you need to dig up and see if they're Aboriginal or not? Do you not respect your own ancestors to not put a road over the top of them? That's just strange. Any questions? Definitely a, a hard fight, and it's it's definitely something that I mean, if we don't fight for our ancestors, who's going to? So that's right. It's yeah, that's right. Yeah, I should mention too, this is kind of related to what you said about development. The um main petroglyph ledge site that we showed that returned to the tribe in 2006 that was kind of a joint effort of a group of people who were stakeholders so this site is at the end of some really expensive housing in the bay and it happened though that one of the people who lived in one of those nice houses she's past Maquati, married to a non-native person they were part of getting the land back. The land was slated to be turned into another house that would have blocked access to the sea and to this ledge. And so the tribe worked with the family and also worked with this group called the Main Coast Heritage Trust, which is you know, kind of an environmental group. But what happened was they, they get land and they were able to swap some land. They, they were able to get the land and purchase it. And then they were able to get from the Passamaquoddy some land that was interior land, not coastal land. So it was kind of a land swap for conservation. So these things can work, but you're right, more often than not, they don't work. And mm -hmm. there are all kinds of examples of sites that are trampled on that haven't been protected. I mean, in the US, at least we have NAGPRA on the Protection Act. I don't know in Australia, it sounds like you don't have anything like that. Um, no. No. No, it's, and, uh, it's, we're very backwards here unfortunately. Well, well NAG present always upheld here and it doesn't really relate to private land. So that's the other problem is that people can do almost anything they want right with private land. But um, Natalie's the archaeologist. So I, I think I take her words, you know, that you really have to fight. Um, being a cultural anthropologist, I'm, I'm not as up on uh, yeah. this, but yeah. So, and the other thing that we have here is um, there's a real, real fear. Uh, of uh, a policy called land rights. Um, and it was actually in, um, in the 1970s and 19, yeah, 1970s and early 1980s, there was actually some polit political will to implement a national land rights act here in Australia. We still don't have that act because the mining companies and media teamed up and put out all their propaganda that all these Aboriginal people were gonna come and take uh, your property in your house uh, and you won't ever get it back. I mean, how ironic for a start, um, but also that was never the purpose of, of the act. So, um, so these days uh, we are still trying to, uh, to convince people that we're not there to take their property, <laughs> that if they've got cultural sites on their property, we need to be able to connect with them in order to continue to build our story. And it's not about taking their land off them. And that's part of our battle. And we've been successful on a couple of times. So, um, you know, just recently we've had a couple of wins with some private landowners as well. Um, but um, more often than not, we've had cultural sites that have been um, destroyed on private property because of the fear around land rights. Anything else? I don't really have a question, but I did appreciate both like all your stories. They're like it makes you realize that this is like of such a big problem. And there's more satellite issues than solutions. But at least there's people that do care. So that In the state of Montana, it's actually been legislated, um, a legislated act titled Indian Education for All. Even though this, this is a state government act, nothing is really done about it. And some of that, some of the proof about that is the fact that even though all the administrators 
at the upper end at this campus, on this campus, have been given more than once um, invitations to come to this workshop. I don't even think anyone has bothered to read the program. And yet they always want, they always want um, a piece of the pie. You know, it's like the little red hen. <laughs> um, and it's just amazing that they will, they will parade Indian people as a, as a magnet to get students to come here. But when it really comes down to it, what is really being done? So that's what this conference is about. And um, yeah, we'll see what happens. So again, hopefully on Sunday, you will take part in the, in the plenary session, which I'll, I will probably move ahead an hour um, so we can end around one, I mean, around noon and we'll move it into 11 to 12. Uh, rather than have the extended discussions. When this was organized, it was organized originally to be in Niagara Falls as an in-house, some people coming there, which that made sense. Um, but it's not happening uh, with the um, Zoom and people Zooming in. So it's easy to move that last session, which is actually going to be an important session, into a, the, that hour earlier from 11 to 12. Um, so hopefully we'll see you then. Any closing comments? I just want to say a big thank you for all the work you're doing in organizing us. Yeah, it's been a solo effort. I have had no help from this university at all, other than some technical help from the, the people to make sure this equipment works because every third day it was breaking down. <laughs> including the first day, and they couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so, all right, hopefully we'll see you on Saturday. Um, it'll be nice. Clark, it'll probably be, you, you may have to take your lesson from Marwin <laughs> and, yeah. and bite yeah, the bullet good. and just get up at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> yep. All right. I'll try. Okay. Have Thank a good you all. Good, you have a good day, Clark. Yeah. I'll see you. Let me stop this.